For more than seven years, 10,000 public school students in the East Ramapo Central School District, just 40 miles north of New York City, have had lead in their school drinking fountains. Students speak of going thirsty after gym class, of mold collecting in the water coolers provided to replace drinking fountains, and of washing their hands next to hazard signs. But the story is much bigger. School district leaders haven't simply failed to fix the water problem. They've failed every part of the school system and hollowed out the educations of tens of thousands of public school students, the vast majority of whom are black and brown. On today's show, we'll dissect the problems in East Ramapo, their causes, and how to fix them. But first, I'd like to ask you to please download, rate, review, and subscribe to Writes This Way. It will help more people find this podcast. Welcome to Writes This Way, a podcast from the New York Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU of New York State. I'm Simon McCormick, senior staff writer at the NYCLU and your host for this podcast, which is focused on the civil rights and liberties issues that impact New Yorkers most. And now I'm joined by two guests. Joanna Miller is the director of the NYCLU's Education Policy Center, and Ignacio Acevedo is the NYCLU's Hudson Valley organizer. Joanna, Ignacio, welcome back to Race This Way. Thanks, Simon. Happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you both. I'm really happy that you could join me here. Joanna, I actually want to start with you. I talked a little bit in the intro about the problems in East Ramapo, but if you could just kind of lay out, I know there's a lot to cover, but if you could give us just a, a little sketch of the problems in East Ramapo, and I'll also just sort of foreshadow a bit of your answer, which is that things have not always been the way they are now in East Ramapo. And, and with that, I'll let you take it away. So East Ramapo is a suburban school district just north of New York City in Rockland County. And in the mid to late 90s, East Ramapo was a really thriving suburban school district. In fact, a lot of families from the city were moving there to put their kids into the schools. East Ramapo had a nationally recognized marching band, and the district was primarily middle class black families, and the schools were really thriving. In 2009, things did begin to change, and currently East Ramapo is the district in the state that has the highest percentage of students in private religious schools of any district in the state. And those schools are almost entirely segregated. They're, if not all white, very, very close to all white students. And it's not a small district together. The public and private students together is about 45,000 students. So we're talking about like a fairly large district. But as the private religious schools have grown and as that community has grown, they have obviously, through numbers, dominated the school board elections and taken over control of the school district funding. And school district funding in New York is responsible for obviously running the public schools, but also for funding certain aspects of private education. And so given this huge population imbalance where the private school population has just so many more voters, so many more numbers, They've managed to be able to take a lot of money out of the public system and divert it into private education. And today, public schools in East Ramapo, which has about 11,000 students, are almost entirely Black and Latino students. They have one of the highest proportion of English language learners in the state. And the public schools have just deteriorated almost to the point of no return. I mean, the buildings themselves, and we'll get into it later, I'm sure, but the buildings themselves are deteriorating. The quality of education is deteriorating. Kids with special needs, either special education needs or kids who are learning English in school have very little chance to get the kind of education they need in these schools because they're so dramatically underfunded. So some people have called East Ramapo an apartheid district. I don't think that's too far to say when you have a system of well-funded private education that only white students attend and a system of public schools that are falling apart, that are attended by all students of color, then calling it an apartheid system is accurate. And it's also, I think, worth noting, like the deteriorating conditions have had really powerful impacts on things like graduation rates, test scores, things like that. Is that still the case? 
Yeah, I mean, there's good evidence. Uh, we don't need these studies, but they do exist that show that the physical condition of a school has a direct impact on things like chronic absenteeism, both because students may be getting sick from the school itself and also because they just don't want to be there if the school is horrible. And that is definitely the case in East Ramapo. It has an extremely high chronic absenteeism rate. It has a terrible graduation rate. Literally less than a quarter of English language learners in East Ramapo graduate. It's one of the worst graduation rates in the state for students who need bilingual education, which is really terrible given that the population of English language learners in the district is growing. The deteriorating physical structures, as well as the lack of certified educators and other support staff means that very few students, in particular, any students who have special needs will graduate in this district. Well, I can tell you that I guess that besides the buildings and the shortage of staff, there's the morale is pretty low. The trust and the school is down. Uh, I can tell you, I had a talking to a parent who apparently for a couple hours, her child was lost in the bus. The child would did not come home. So it was in a panic. And this has to do with the lack of staff, the lack of training of the staff, but the parents are pretty much, they don't know if they can trust the school system right now. They are at their last straw and they're afraid that if they send their kid to school or they put in their kids in danger. So it's a completely different school than when it started. And one of the latest, I mean, every so often some new crisis sort of seems to pop up in East Ramapo, but the latest controversy or major issue that popped up was lead in the water that in the schools, like drinking fountains and, and other water sources. Joanna, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So the latest thing that we've learned about the schools is that they all failed a state mandated building condition survey and every school building failed because every school building has water faucets and water fountains that are lead contaminated fixtures. Unfortunately, though, what we learned is this actually is not a new condition. It's just that the district managed to put off the inspection for many, many years. They got waivers from the state to not complete this building condition survey. And so the news is that they finally completed the mandated survey and they failed across the board. But the water fountains have actually been either switched off or um, blocked off from student use because of the lead since at least 2016. And lots of students that we've talked to have told us that they can't get water in school as a result. There are not working water fountains in their schools. This year, the school district has asked every student to include a reusable water bottle on their school supply list, which just shows again that they have no intention of fixing these water fountains. And what we've been told is that students can fill that water bottle once per day from a water cooler, like the big five gallon water coolers, um, but that those will not be refilled. So once they're out for the day or the week or however long, there's no more water for the students at all. And that, that's across ages from four all the way up until seniors in high school. So that's the latest conditions issue in East Ramapo. But like so many other things, it's really been building over time. Yeah, that is really striking. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to the water, that the, what parents complain is, and students is the lack of communication. Like they don't know when this is going to be fixed. Like when is this going to stop? The reality is that kids are, you know, after school, they have maybe soccer practice. There's no water there. Their kids are coming home with an empty bottle soaking wet. Why? Because the buses are hot. They're running around in school. So the parents are afraid is my son going to pass out from dehydration? You know, what other problems is my kid developing? Do I have to take him to the doctor because he developed something? So I think a lot of this comes from fear and the lack of communication and transparency the schools are having with the community. So yeah, I, most of them ask me like, when is this going to stop? And have there, do you know of any health impacts that have been caused by this situation? We have heard complaints from the parents. They're starting to go to see the doctors and they're asking if this is linked to their health issues that their kids have. But there's so many things. They're like, you know, the, the lad, physically the stress, I think, a lot of the parents are complaining that their kids are literally dealing with anxiety. Some of them have panic simply because their water is not good. Their food is not good. It feels like sometimes their kids are being harmed by the schools. 
Ignacio mentioned the food. So I will just add that last year, all of the kitchens in the district went offline because they did not have adequate ventilation for the gas fumes that you need in a commercial kitchen. And so while they were waiting to complete those renovations, they were serving kids frozen food out of a central location. They were eating cold meals. They were basically frozen sandwiches, peanut butter sandwiches. And we actually did hear about kids getting sick from eating that food, getting all kinds of stomach issues from eating that food and coming home sick. So the district has failed for many years to provide clean water to students. Last year, they could not feed students appropriately. This year, they claim that will be different, but it's a really horrific thing. If you think about it, you can't begin to start to learn English or history or math if you're hungry and thirsty. And if you're a parent feeling like your kid might be exposed to toxins or food that is poison, you're not really worried about who their teacher is or whether they're doing their homework. You're very much worried for their physical safety. So until they fix those things, it's almost useless to talk about improving the academic program. Right. And yes, I think we've sketched out a pretty good sampling of some of the myriad problems in East Ramapo. I want to kind of move now to talking about the primary causes of the problems in East Ramapo. Joanna, can you talk about some of those, like the structural issues that have led us to this place? You sort of alluded to it a bit in your intro, but can you get into some of that? Yeah. In New York State, most school districts are funded by the voters. They are funded by property taxes, and those property taxes are voted on by the people who are going to pay them, by all of the voters in the district. And There are something like 750 school districts in our state, and usually 748 of them will pass a school budget, meaning the voters will say, yes, there is a small increase in our property taxes, but that's worth it because we pay that to support our school system. There's literally usually one to two districts at most where the voters do not adopt a budget for the schools. In East Ramapo, the voters have voted down seven of the last eight school budgets. And cumulatively, it's estimated that that has denied the school district close to $30 million in funding. East Ramapo is one of the only districts in the state that is growing, and the taxes have not been raised in six years. So they have not funded the school district in so long that what we're seeing now is just the cumulative problems of a voting population that does not want to support public schools. And now I want to turn to... Ignacio, faced with that structural issue that that Joanna is talking about, a lack of will from the white majority to adequately fund the schools, can you talk a bit about the organizing you're doing in East Ramapo and then also what you're hearing from parents, from students, from advocates on both what they want and also what they're trying to do to get what they want? Well, when it comes to the core, I think the parents and the children they just want to be safe. They want to go to a school where they feel safe, where there's, they have a teacher in class. It's not 25 kids and no teacher. They want to have eat the food that they'll provide it and not get sick. You know, parents don't want to get a call in the middle of the day, go pick up your kid because he has stomach problems from eating the food. I think right now our work has picked up because of that reason. Parents are fed up. They're, they're scared of their kids and a weekly basis I talk to a mom and she's in tears like I don't know what to do it's like my kid comes home and cries with me yeah I wish it was just like happening to one kid or two kids but this is every week they're getting fed up we're organizing we're having uh, our leadership team of parents is growing and they're realizing that they have power they have rights their kids have rights and their rights are being stolen by a group of majority group in the private schools So a lot of my organizing has been around having meetings. We're preparing ourselves with the state agenda of NICLU. We are teaching them what is going to be our work for the next year, how they can participate, how would they be part of the decision-making process, and they'll be an empower. The biggest thing that I hear is like somebody is listening to us and somebody values my voice. And I'm getting a lot of the parents who say, this is the time I want to do something. So yeah, we have, we're going to begin doing our, our monthly meetings, community meetings once a month in Spring Valley, and that's where parents can participate. Yeah, and so you said something interesting, which is that the parents feel 
grateful or happy to be listened to. It, it, it seems like that's one of the biggest issues, right? That the board just has not shown an interest in the concerns of parents. Would you say that's fair? And would you say any of that is like changing at all? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll give you an example that, that I mentioned again, uh, one of the child's getting lost in the bus. The mom was calling the bus company nonstop for her child. No answer. She called me. I answer. So the leadership group of parents that we have, they're coming, you know, we're taking them, we're with them side by side, meeting with the leaders in the community, with their representatives. That's something they themselves says, I never talked to my assemblyman. I never talked to my senator. Like, this is the first time I feel heard and I feel empowered. That is good to hear, though, also discouraging that the leadership within the district has not been responsive. I can put a really fine point on that. 50% of the incoming student body in East Ramapo are English language learners. There is not one Spanish speaking fluent member of the school board in East Ramapo. So we're talking about a lot of parents who, who do not communicate in English or do not communicate comfortably in English. And there's nobody in the school board who can even speak to them. Yeah, that is remarkable. Speaking of communicating, Joanna, I, I know we recently, the NYCLU and the Education Policy Center put out a survey and really tried to get some specifics on what it is parents, students, people in the public school community want from their schools. We've talked a bit, Ignacio, you've laid out a lot of those concerns. There's desires. Joanna, can, can you talk in terms of what the survey sort of revealed? Yeah, this really goes to Ignacio's point about making sure that people have a voice and can be heard. I mentioned the voting imbalance. Something like 40%, maybe a little bit more, of the adults in Spring Valley, which is one of the primary towns in this school district, are foreign-born. And many of those people, unless they have gotten their U.S. citizenship, can't vote in the school board election. So outside of New York City, if you're not a citizen, you cannot vote in a school board election. And that means they can't vote for the school budget, even if they fully support it and increase in taxes, their voice does not matter. And so we wanted to give them a place where their voice would matter, even though their votes cannot be counted in the formal election. We wanted to make sure that they had a place to be heard. And we also wanted to show the district that often says there's quote unquote low turnout in the public school neighborhoods, that there's actually not low turnout. What there is, is low numbers of registered voters, of people who are permitted to vote under law. And so we set a goal, the school board budget or the school district budget this year failed by something like 1,800 votes. We set a goal to get that many votes in an informal sort of poll or election. And we got over 2,000 parents who voted in our poll who said, yes, they absolutely would approve a property tax increase in order to fully fund the public schools. And then we asked them a second question, which was, where would you put that money? And overwhelmingly, people talked about um, the physical condition of the buildings, improving things like ceilings and windows that are cracked and floor tiles that are peeling up and addressing the lead in the water fountains and fixing the food. As Ignacio said, like you can't send your kids somewhere where you think they're going to be eating toxic food. And so parents said overwhelmingly, we would spend that money to make sure that there is healthy food and there are functioning kitchens in every school district. It went down the line from there. A lot of parents talked about safety and security in the school. We've had parents tell us their kids don't go to the bathroom because the bathrooms are not monitored and they're afraid of getting bullied or getting beaten up, even if they just go into the bathrooms. So parents told us stories across the spectrum. And out of our 2,200 votes, I believe we had two votes where people said, no, they would not approve a property tax increase. So there was overwhelming support among public school parents of funding these important repairs. And so this is a question for both of you. How do we make it so that this public school community, which you've both laid out what they want, and, and it's clear that they would vote for the funding, they do think that the schools need the funding, but they just keep getting outvoted every time, ignored by the school board, ignored by the school bus company, ignored by the private school community. How do we change that? So we have two kind of policy approaches. And Ignacio can definitely jump in on either of these, but also we can talk about our organizing approaches. So on the policy side, though, 
we have two initiatives. One is we're asking the state to take over operations and funding for this district. The state has sunk a lot of money into this district to try to undo some of the harms that were done by the white voting majority, but they haven't sunk any effective governance reform into the district to go along with that money. And so the money just keeps going to the wrong things, including primarily buses for private school children. And so the busing costs are completely out of control and there's no one managing that cost or saying, no, we can't spend this. So we're asking the state to take over both governance and funding. I think that's it's an emergency ask. It's very urgent. And we think that when the state hears the stories from the families, that hopefully they will understand why they have to take a bigger role here. The second one, and this is a longer term plan, but we would like to see a system where undocumented folks and immigrants of all different statuses can vote in school board elections, particularly parents of public school students. Everyone who lives there is benefiting or feeling the effects if the school system is or is not working. Think about the traffic, for example, just the traffic of school buses in in your neighborhood or your area. Everyone has a reason to want to weigh in on how the schools are run. And right now, being uh, a property owner who is a citizen and has no connection to the public schools whatsoever is valued in our system, gives you a bigger voice than if you are a, literally a parent of a public school student. But um, if you're an immigrant and you cannot vote or a non-citizen, you can't vote. So over the long term, we'd like to see a system that permits that. That is already the case in New York City, although there's some litigation happening right now. We'll see what ends up happening. But currently, we believe that any school district could decide without any change in state law to permit non-citizens to vote in school board elections. And we're trying to find school districts that would willingly do that. Yeah, I'll I'll just add, actually, in San Francisco, just won a lawsuit that allows them to continue to permit non-citizens to vote in their school board elections. But I think when it comes to the organizing, the parents... Uh, the leadership noticed that we have to go for the big win. They want to transform the school, not come back every few years and then, you know, do another patch in. And I think most of them are understanding that like, this is going to be a multi-year fight. And then the parents have to be active. The parents have to participate, especially even if we win those asks, they need to make sure that they're implemented. And I think that's where some parents or community members we forget like okay we solved the problem let's go home i think many of them are understanding that at least in east ramapo you cannot go home you have to stay vigil the other thing i wanted to kind of it's not just that these fixes that you both are, are talking about are urgently needed it's that as bad as things are things are about to get much worse is that right the district is facing a fiscal cliff brought about in part because they've had some money from the federal government's, you know, like COVID relief bill, but that that money's drying up. And yeah, things are going to, as unimaginable as it might be for the people who have listened to this all the way through here so far, things are about to get worse. Is that right? Yeah. We think in the next two years, the district has provided us with information that indicates that they may have to lay off teachers, including canceling full day kindergarten programs that they would have to cancel arts programs, extracurriculars, that they would have to cancel any classes for high school students that are not strictly required to graduate. So things can get much worse than they are. And in fact, Moody's, the credit rating agency, has recently downgraded East Ramapo's rating to one level above being considered a junk investment. And that means that even right now, it will be almost impossible for the district to get a loan. So if they need to issue a bond, for example, to raise money to do some of the capital and infrastructure projects, even to fix the water fountains, just to give like a very specific example, it's very unlikely they will be able to raise that money unless there's better intervention from the state. And Moody specifically cited the unwillingness of the white majority voters to fund the schools as the reason for the credit downgrade. So things can get worse. We're seeing some very ominous signs. And if the state does not intervene, they absolutely will get worse. Maybe I'll just add this school district is growing. So can you imagine there's a influx of immigrant families coming with kids trying to make a a, a living in uh, East Ramapo? There's classes with 25 kids with no teachers. Those classes are going to get bigger. 
if there's no water for the 11,000 they have now, how, or they can have water for the uh, next year for 14,000 kids or 13,000. So a lot of the parents and community members are realizing that this is not going to get better anytime soon if we don't start doing our job, which means, you know, finding a solution. As we close out here, my, my last question for both of you is, in the face of all of this, what gives you both hope to continue to push for changes in East Ramapo? And what can people listening who want to join that that fight do? The thing that gives me hope is the parents and the young people that we work with. We have a student ambassadors group in East Ramapo, of current high school students, and the parents have showed up. They've gone to legislative visits. They've gone out into the streets to get people to vote in our poll. I think they are completely committed to seeing this through because this is their life and their kids' lives, and this is the only way to make it any better. So the parents' dedication keeps me going, keeps me coming back and making sure that we show up for them the way that they're showing up for their families. If people are listening and want to get involved, you can call the governor. We will be putting out more communications on this, but you don't have to wait for us. You can pick up the phone right now and call Kathy Hochul and tell her that she must take over operations of this school district at the very least to address the water crisis and make sure that the kids are not being poisoned in schools. And she should hear that. She should hear that from all of you. I guess I would say when we're doing the symbolic vote, there was like little kids. I'm guessing 12, some teenagers who their parents were afraid of filling up our cars. They were like, I was like, I don't know if I want to put my, my name. I don't, I don't know if I want to be recognized. My jeopardizes my status. And then hearing the kid, the child say, dad, please fill that up. Please. We need to participate. That tells me that even if this generation, the parents might be a little afraid, the kids who are growing up in this issue will participate and they will make a change. We do have other leaders in the community who they graduated recently. And they're participating now. They're motivated to make this change. I would say if people who are listening to this, maybe you don't have the time, but you might want to do to give some funding. We need funding for the training of parents. We need transportation, parents to get involved. They, you know, somebody got to take care of the kids to participate, to volunteer, to do babysitting, to give people rides. So there's so many ways for you to participate. And if you're a person who wants to join our meetings, our monthly meetings, and we do have a... I sign up for people who want to get informed and, and are contactless. So reach out. All right. Well, with that, Joanna Ignacio, thank you so much for coming back to Writes This Way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for listening. You can find out more about everything we talked about today by visiting nyclu.org. And you can follow us at NYCLU on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you have questions or comments about Rights This Way, you can email us at podcast at nyclu.org. Until next time, I'm Simon McCormack. Thank you for fighting for a fair New York.